I feel welcomed. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's apparent that the uh, Hebrew, uh, during the time of the writing of the New Testament book of Hebrews, um, what struggled with confusion when it came to the purpose and the function of the law of God. And the reason I say this is because so much of the book of Hebrews is really directed at clarification of what the law is about and its, its function. The law was never put in place. Uh, the uh, Old Testament law, as well as the New Testament law, was never put in place uh, necessarily to make you or I okay with God. It can't do that. It, it just functionally cannot do that. The way that we approach God has always been from uh, the beginning of the Bible uh, all the way to the end of the Bible uh, by faith. It's, it's clear that that's the way that you and I are to come to God. In fact, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 makes his point abundantly clear. I want to read to you uh, some of that chapter. I'm just going to read till I get tired, all right? Beginning with, with Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Listen to this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You kind of get the gist of this. How are you commended to God? By faith. It's never by trying to keep some rules or, or, or laws that those never make you okay with God. But you know what? We fall into this insidious trap so easily. We so easily go to the rulemaking side of the equation of life. You know, as a parent, you can do this more easy than you think in the way that you teach your young children the Bible. Uh, let me just give you young parents an instruction right now. Just hear me on this because this is so easy to do. You can Take out a, a really cool Bible verse that says maybe honor mom and dad that it may go well with you that you may live long on this earth. Okay, let's take that one out. You may take that Bible verse out and have your little ones memorize it and say, now, if you do this, this makes mommy and daddy happy and it pleases God. Now, those things are kind of true, but here's what you unintentionally are doing. You're teaching that little bugger to be a real keeper. You're teaching him or her, that the way you please God and you please mommy and daddy is by obedience to some rules. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do some of that. Of course, you're the parent, amen? But get this. With your little ones, you first and foremost must teach them it's all about relationship with Jesus Christ. It cannot be right with God without relationship with Jesus Christ. You've got to hammer that into their head. And these other things are subservient to that big thought, amen? But if you don't hammer on the relationship with Jesus Christ, what you'll raise up is a little legalist, and you'll unintentionally do that. And that's why I think so many young people fall away from their faith. They don't really know what it is to have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. They've been taught that I do good by performance. And we've unintentionally raised up these children then in the Christian community. They don't get it, amen? So you've got to be relentlessly teaching them. It's all about being right because of what Jesus has done for you. And everything else finds its proper place under that main kind of teaching. The one who is the intentional worshiper uh, in Jesus Christ will understand that we please him by faith. We please him by faith. This is what the ancients were commended for. Think with me, on a mo uh, 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 think with me for a moment on something. I just want you to, to think on this. What's one of the most grievous sins that we can commit? I have a proposal for you. It's rejection of Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation. If we reject that, we're saying, I don't need you, Jesus. I don't need your death. I don't need to be atoned for. I don't need to experience what it means to be a redeemed person. I could do this on my own. And in that state of rejection of Jesus Christ, you are condemned for your sin and you are hell-bound. 
Amen? It's a grievous sin to reject the offer of salvation that has been freely given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul sums it all really well when he says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. I love how Paul, you know, doesn't mince words. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So the Hebrew writer, knowing that his Hebrew audience that he was directing that book to initially, kind of got you know, confused by thinking that observance of the law made them okay uh, with God. He does a lot of clarification in the book of Hebrews, telling us, no, it's by faith, and that faith is not a blind faith. That faith is directed towards the work that God has done in Jesus Christ on your behalf. Jesus has paid a price for sin you could not pay. He's redeemed you from your sin. You need to believe that and receive that. That, my friends, is how you're okay with God. And then the law finds its proper place when all that is figured out. We're nearing the end of our intentional uh, worship series. We're on week seven already. Uh, I don't know, time just flies by, doesn't it? It goes by really fast. And this morning we're praising God for redemption in Jesus Christ. And what we're called to do in response to this redemptive work that Christ did for us on the cross is to believe, first of all, that we need it. Believe that Christ really did it and then receive it and let it change how we do life. Praise God for redemption in Jesus Christ. I pray that's on our hearts, it's in our minds, and it affects how we do life. If that be the case, then we're entering into this realm called worship that God calls us to. Our series goal is simply this, that you see God as he truly is and become so preoccupied with this that you truly worship him in your heart and it spills over into your lifestyle. Now, preoccupy means dominate or engross the mind of someone to the exclusion of other thought. And what is frequently confusing when it comes to this whole idea that Christ has redeemed us and the law and faith is, where is the law? What is the right use of the law in all this? And how is it to function? That usually confuses people. I'm going to talk on that for a few moments with you this morning. And then I'm going to look at why Christ's redemption is so powerful, the implications of it, and then how we ought to respond to it. I've talked on redemption a couple times already this morning. Let me give you a simple definition uh, for the word redemption. It means the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for a payment. And so we have gained our salvation in exchange for a payment, and that payment has been the offering of the life of Jesus Christ for our sins. So that was his act of redemption for us. And we need to be praising God for this frequently. I mean, it ought to be right in there. When we praise Jesus for being the Son of God, we praise Jesus for being crucified on our behalf, and we praise Jesus for his resurrection. Uh, Redemption ought to be right in the mix of that kind of praise. And we praise uh, Jesus for this redemption that he has gotten for us so that you and I now can walk as blood-bought, redeemed people of God, no longer under the dominion of sin, but now under the dominion of the person of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk on the purpose and the nature of the law of God. And after that, I'm going to get into then the implications and our response to the redemption that Jesus has uh, wrought for us. Have you ever seen a shadow of something and known what that shadow represents? Um, What does that shadow represent? Somebody riding a bike, right? You can you can kind of see what the shadow is implying. Uh, I, we have um, shadows around the house. I know what they are. I know, well, that's a shadow of a lamp. Or, you know, follow what I'm saying. You get really familiar with shadows. Uh, but there's something about shadows I want you, you to note today. They're not the real thing. They're indicative of the real thing. They're two-dimensional and they're dark, Right? They have no color. And so when your eyes look up from the shadow and you see the object that represents it, you go from looking at something that's two-dimensional because the shadow's on a flat piece of ground, it's two-dimensional, 
colorless, and you look up and all of a sudden you see the three-dimensional object that it represents. You see the color of it, you see the depth of it, the width of it, the height of it. More fully, the shadow was merely indicative of the reality of something else. Amen? Would you agree with me on that? This is the analogy that Paul uses when it comes to things uh, uh, like the law and the tabernacle. Um, did I just say Paul? I meant the Hebrew writer. I keep doing that this morning. If I said that, forget it. If I didn't say it, just chalk it up. I'm really getting old and I forget things frequently now. So I wake up in the morning. I know about you. Both knees hurt. The top of my foot hurts. My elbow hurts. My shoulder hurts. I said, man, when did this start happening? About 30 years ago. Anyway, um, so, so a shadow is something that is supposed to lead us to the reality. And that's how the writer of Hebrews talks about the law and the tabernacle, uh, that, that, that they were shadows of the reality that was to come in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not the reality themselves. They are connected to the reality that was to follow in Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you getting this? So now understanding that, let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, as this kind of tells us now that the, the nature and the purpose of the law. The law is only a shadow, 2D, black and white, not the real reality to be experienced. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would not have stopped being offered, for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, because really the power of those sacrifices lie in what they were pointing to. And what were they pointing to? The once for all sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, the shadow, to establish the second, the reality found in Jesus Christ. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest has offered for, uh, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where, there ha- where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer uh, necessary. So let's talk on the purpose of the law a little bit. I'm not going to camp here very long, but I just want you to understand the purpose of the law. What is it there for? It's not to save us. It's a shadow connected to the reality that we're supposed to be experiencing. And so right away here, the writer of Hebrews um, notes in in verse 3 that the law is a revealer and a reminder of sin. That's point number one if you're taking notes in your note guide. I like to point that out so people get in the rhythm and know where they're at. The, the, the law is a revealer and a reminder of sin. Paul says over in Romans chapter 7, the second half of verse 7, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said do not covet. So part of the purpose of the law is to reveal to you and I that we're desperate sinners. Amen? that we're broken and we're not doing right. King David of the Old Testament experienced this very thing when it comes to the law, when he had committed sin with Bathsheba. And Psalm 51 is a writing that uh, he put forth in, in the midst of that revealing and reminding of his sin, you know, by the law. Listen to what he says in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, 
Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justify when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desire faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The law revealed and reminded David, you've sinned. It crushed him. It broke him. And David pleaded, God, do a work in me. Blot out the sin. And here's what's really cool about this Psalm 51. Everything that David was pleading for, we now have because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because of Jesus Christ, we have a pure heart. Because of Jesus Christ, we can have a steadfast spirit. Because of Jesus Christ, we're in the presence of God, and the Holy Spirit fills our lives, and we have a joy of salvation. Everything that Paul, or excuse me, that, that uh, King David was praying for here, we've achieved now an experience in Christ as redeemed people. Praise God for redemption in Jesus Christ. So one of the purposes of the law is what? It reveals and it reminds us of our sin. Let's get even more forthright. We, we'll see how the law is connected to the reality of Jesus Christ. We'll see how the shadow ties right in uh, to the reality that we're supposed to experience in Jesus. It's found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, which says, so the law was our guardian. In other words, it was our schoolmaster. If you go back to the King James Version of the Bible, instead of using the word guardian, or use the word schoolmaster, until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. So the law was our guardian, it was our schoolmaster until Christ came. Point number two is this. The law is a schoolmaster meant to lead you to Jesus. Here's what the ancient schoolmaster did in the times of the writing of the Bible. He would go to the home of a prominent family and he would grab the child that was supposed to be taken to school, taken to synagogue, and he would take the child by hand And he would lead that child and take that child and escort that child to the place of education. The schoolmaster, the guardian, wasn't the teacher, per se. He was an escort to get the child to where they needed to be to be educated. So the law, we're being told here by the Apostle Paul in Galatians, the law acts as an escort, as a guide to get you to the foot of the cross. The the law is a shadow. It's connected to Jesus, but it's not the reality to be experienced. Jesus is the reality to be experienced, so the law asks as an escort to get you to the foot of the cross and see that you can be saved from your sins by the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. Amen? So the law is a revealer and a reminder of sin, and it's an escort and a guide to get you to the reality to be experienced in Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you seeing this? This is a part of the functioning of the law. And it continues to be a part of the functioning of the law now. Amen? So the question that often is asked is, once I am saved, once I am redeemed, once I'm a blood-bought person, once I've received Christ as my Savior, what what purpose is there to the law? I was going to laugh at that, but I'm not going to laugh at that. At any rate, um, so what, what is the purpose of the law? I mean, I've heard well-intentioned Christians say, you know, I'm under grace, I'm under faith. I don't even know what that, or under faith, under under the law, I'm under grace now. I don't, the law, what, what, what? You were never under the law. The law was always meant to be a revealer and a reminder of your sin, and it was always meant to be as an escort to take you to see your need of salvation in Jesus Christ. You were never under the law. The law was never supposed to be over you, amen? Does that make any sense to you? Anyway, think on that. But once you're saved, 
what's the function of law? What's to be written on your heart? And it's to become the way that you delight in doing your life. That's how to fit into the redeemed person's life. Hebrews 8.10 gets after this as well as Hebrews 10.16, which we already read this morning. Let me read to you Hebrews 8.10. It says this. This is a covenant I will establish for my people of Israel at that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So here's point number three. After new birth in Jesus, the law is to become the desire of the heart. As Hebrews 10.16 told us, the Holy Spirit puts the law of God in our hearts and writes them on our minds. And so the law was not ever meant to be this external club to try to beat people into proper behavior so that they could be okay with God. It was always meant to be this internal desire to be lived out. And now as redeemed, blood-bought people in Jesus Christ, God says, my Holy Spirit will write my law on your mind and put them in your heart and it'll become your delight to live your life that way. Amen? That's now the role that the law plays in the people of God. Now, if you're not experiencing that, ask God to give you that. Ask him to give you that kind of perspective. Ask him to open up your heart to the beautiful truths of his law. That's really the, the, the way Hebrews was putting it to the people of, uh, of that time. Basically, the Hebrew writer was saying, you gotta understand the law of God is to be your delight. It's to be written on your heart. It's not to be something you dutifully follow to think you're gonna be okay with God. Instead, you, you're, you're saved because of what Jesus has done, and the response to that salvation is to have his law written on your heart, amen? But the law never, ever could save. Praise God for redemption in Jesus Christ. Um, Now we're going to go on. We're going to go on to what this redemption has done for us and how our response uh, should be to this redemption. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 24. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So let's talk about implications of redemption. Through Jesus, you can draw near to God in full assurance of faith. What a powerful statement. In Jesus, you can draw near to God in full assurance of faith. First of all, this means access is granted through Jesus. Access to God is granted through Jesus. The law could not and was not designed to grant you access to God. That's not its function. That's not its purpose. It's a revealer and reminder of sin. It's a guide to take you to the foot of the cross to see your need of Jesus and once saved, it becomes what God writes on your heart and how to do life best. But it cannot save you, amen? Amen? Well, weak, but I'll take it. If you put your faith in Christ, you enter into the status of redeemed person. The Hebrew writer put it this way. You become a participant in the new covenant that Christ has made available by dying on the cross. Now, to the ancient Jew, the the biblical Jew of Jesus' time, covenant language was a love language. But we don't, it's lost on us. We don't see it as love language. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, if I entered into covenant with somebody, we had an exchange of identity. Now, when we enter into covenant with Jesus Christ, he takes on our identity as a sinner, went to the cross, died for our sins, atoned for us, made redemption for us. We then get his identity. What's his identity? Son of God. We become sons and daughters of God. We enter into the family of God. And God calls us his children his beloved, and we become brothers and sisters with our Savior, Jesus Christ. We enter into this family kind of relationship. Praise God for redemption in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There's no other way to go to God. This is the only access point. You know what happens, I think, frequently, especially to to newer believers. We hear a message like this, and I, I hope we believe it, But then we go out there and we start living real life and we mess up. 
And the accuser of our soul, Satan, the devil, will come and say, see, you're not really a child of God. Look, you just messed up. Look, you just can't, you can't even love God for an hour without, you know, swearing or whatever. You know, you're just a failure. And he brings all this condemnation to us. You know what? We're not saved by what we do. Now, I'm not saying you should just sin and think it's no big deal. But listen to me. You are not saved by what you do. You are saved by whom you believe in. And when that accusation comes to you, you have to stand fast and and reliant upon the redemption that Jesus has made available to you by his death on the cross. Amen? And you have to say to the accuser of your soul, no, I know I'm not a very good person and I messed up and God forgive me for that, but I am still the child of God. I'm still a beloved one of God. Amen? Because the devil wants to get us running around with our heads chopped off like a bunch of chickens with their heads chopped off. That's a graphic picture, isn't it? Years ago, we decided on the Norby little fun acreage that we would raise a bunch of chickens and I'd butcher them. I did that one time in my life. Never wanted to do that again. I just hated that moment of chopping their heads off and then they would run around. It it was gross. I remember there's one big rooster. I kind of named him Big Mistake. And he was sitting there looking at me, so trusting. And I said, buddy, I'm going to just chop your head off here. I'm sorry. I don't really want to do this at all. And I did it, and I felt terrible. And I, you know, after we had those chickens, I know, I know, a lot of you say, come on. You, you know, this is South Dakota. I understand. We hunt and kill things here. But at any rate, I, I just, ah. And, and when I read this scripture about what we have in Jesus, and I see what the devil gets us doing, chasing our tails and running around. I just get that picture that's a bloody mess with a bunch of chickens without their heads. When we begin to chase after all this condemnation thing that Satan would have to chase after. We are beloved children in Christ. Access is granted to God. Amen? Step into it and embrace it this morning. Um, Some of us haven't had the greatest family relationships. So even as I talk about this idea that we're family with God, you may not have the warm, fuzzy feelings that you ought to have. I grew up with a very uh, uh, distant father who never wanted me to bother him. And, uh, you know, kind of that era. And so I, when I first came to God, thought, I don't want to be a bother to God. (laughs) You follow what I'm saying? And I thought, well, God's busy with big things. What would he care about me personally, um, that's nonsense. God loves being in relationship with us. He loves having you as his beloved sons and daughters. I remember coming home as a young dad to a house full of kids, and there was always little ones there. It seemed like for about 10 to 15 years, we had several kids. And they would uh, just be so happy to see me after work, and Vicky would be happy for them to be happy to see me. She was tired of them by that point in the day. And they would come and they'd grab my legs. I remember this a lot. They'd hug your calf when they were little, and I'd walk around with them on my feet. Would you ever do some of that as a dad? And I'd wrestle with them, and, and that was just such a great moment. And I never once said to them, when they would greet me like that, away from me, you little insignificant person. I really just don't have time for this. I loved it, and I would wrestle with them. But they do get it to an age where, where that's, you know, that wrestling with you can actually hurt you dads. So I remember when my son was 12, Nate was 12, and he was a strong boy. One day, for some unknown reason, he just decided to tackle me in the front yard from behind. I did not see it coming. I think he was horizontally airborne when he hit the small of my back. And I crumpled like a pretzel, like, you know. I went down, and I thought, I broke my back. I couldn't breathe. I'm laying there catching my breath. And then we had a conversation why you don't tackle your dad when you're this big anymore when he's not aware you're going to do that. In fact, tackling dad at this point in life, probably don't want to do that anymore. But my kids grew up, and they got more dignified like children would. The girls, you know, it's not appropriate to wrestle with your 13-year-old girl. You know, it's just not. And they, got, they were still happy to see me, but there was more of a dignified response to, to my coming home or, or whatever. Um, and I think something happens to us. I'm taking this someplace. In our Christian faith, when we first come to Jesus, I don't know how you were. I was so in love with him. I'd cry, I'd weep, and every time I was in his presence, I was hugging on his calf. 
And then you get familiar with them and you kind of grow up in your faith and you get more dignified and you kind of lose that sense of awe and that sense of what he's done for you. And I want to tell you this morning, return to that awe. Get a little undignified with Jesus. Love on him, be expressive, hug on him. Access to him has been granted. Access to God, that is, has been granted through the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. Secondly, get this. This is another implication. Cleansing of the heart is accomplished. Never believe the lie that somehow you are the exception to the rule and you are beyond the forgiveness of God. Never, ever believe that lie. Sometimes we're stuck in the mud. Uh, we're stuck in the, the, the failures of our own lives. And it may be because of some things that we've done that we need to repent for and do some work with the Lord. And sometimes life is just difficult. It just happens uh, to us. No matter where you're at today, I can hear God saying, Beloved, get out of the mud. I've given you a new heart, and I've given you new life. Stand fast in that. I want to write my laws. I want to write my ways right into the heart of how you do life. Amen? And God cleanses us, and this is something that's so phenomenal. That's one of the implications of the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. And so let's talk about response to redemption real quickly here. First of all, sincerity of our hearts is required in response. You know what? That's what this whole intentional worship uh, series has been about, that you and I would come to God authentically with sincere hearts and that we would live for him seven days a week. Amen? That's the response that God wants from us to the redemption that Christ has made available on the cross, that we would be sincere followers of Jesus Christ and step into this full life of living for God 24-7 and it would just become how we do life. And secondly, hold unswervingly to the hope that you have in Jesus. Her, hold unswervingly to this hope that you have in Jesus. Um, Man, I tell you, this is what the book of Hebrews, this is what it's trying to get you and I to do, is to turn our hope from reliance upon self and the law and all that to this unswerving hope upon Jesus, no matter what we're going through, that we're holding on to the hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in the rest of the Bible, this message is frequently talked about. The Apostle Paul talks about it over in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. I want us to, to read this out loud together. Would you read this hope declaration with me, please? Here we go. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that? I believe it with all my heart. So no matter what you're going through, let this hope reside in you. That's what it means to be redeemed. Praise God for redemption in Jesus. One last response to redemption in Christ. Spur one another on to love and good deeds. Listen, as a redeemed, blood-bought follower of Jesus Christ, as one who has access to God, who understands this hope we have in God and, and understands your status as child of God, you can change every single situation you're in if you want to. If you're obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, you can be an influence to those around you for the glory of God. Amen? Bring that to bear on those around you. This is living a life of worship. Let it rip. Let it show. Let your joy of, of salvation in God be evident. Bring that to bear on those around you. Spur one another on to love and good deeds. Here's one final thought, and we're done with the message this morning. It's a simple thought. I've been kind of getting at this all morning long. Praise God for redemption in Jesus. I pray it's on your heart. It's written in your mind. It's how you do life. Amen? If that be the case, then guess what? We're intentional worshipers. I want us to say that out loud together. Would you say that with me, please? Praise God for redemption in Jesus. I pray that rattles around in your mind all week long. Let's pray. Lord God, I want to thank you for redemption in Jesus Christ. 
I want to thank you for all the implications that it implies. You know, access to you is granted. We have two cleansing of the heart, Lord. I pray that we'd respond accordingly then, Lord, um, that we would have a sincerity of faith, that we'd have an unswerving hope in you, and that we'd spur one another on to... uh, love and good deeds. Lord, I pray that these things would be more than stuff we talk about. It'd be how we do life, Lord. I want to pray for the one that's here this morning, Lord, that perhaps has never really understood uh, what Jesus is offering. Maybe one who's been confused about the law, thinking that they had to be somehow good or right uh, by obeying some rules and, and, and traditions, Lord, and thinking that's what Christianity is. It is not. And God, I pray today would have clarified that for such a one. I pray that that one that finds himself in that situation that would even now, Lord Jesus, turn to you and believe in you and receive your offer of salvation by your redemptive work done on the cross. I pray for such a one just to be born again and to be blood-bought. And I pray that that one, I pray for this for all of us who, who love you and proclaim your name, that you would write your law in our hearts that it become the desire uh, uh, for how we do life, Lord. And so that the law finds its rightful place now in us who are born again, blood-bought, redeemed people. God, thank you. We praise you and give you glory. In your name, Jesus, and all God people said,